where you are checking in from. That would be wonderful. I hope those of you who sprung forward are doing okay. We also have our wonderful landscape person here and he loves to blow. So hopefully there is not too much noise in the background. Can't hear any of it. <laughs> good, good, I can. Talks, kids, landscape, laundry machines, all good. <laughs> wonderful. So please check in and we'll get started here. Um, it's wonderful to have you um, here today. We are very, very lucky to have three incredible presenters present together about their work, specifically uh, talking about how Frame can be used uh, to promote equity in the context of adaptations, of course. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Shannon Wilty Sturman, Dr. Anna Bauman, and Dr. J.D. Smith here. And I will provide a very brief introduction to them and hand it over to them in a moment. But we start with the usual um, logistical slides, news and updates. Um, so uh, this is a moment when we invite you, actually, if you wouldn't mind to go back, Kara, if you have any good news or any kind of news related to, loosely related to adaptations, fidelity, and tailoring, this is a great time to share those in the chat. If you have new resources to share, new publications, or any kind of new uh, funded grants that you would like us to know about, drop them in the chat, please. And then we will, uh, we can go to the next slide, Kara. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a number of uh, items happening that we are aware of. First of all, um, the University of Colorado School of Medicine awards DNI Science program. This is Russ, Russ Glasgow's program, Russ's program. They are hiring uh, dissemination and implementation scientists. So if you want to apply and learn more, please uh, use the link or the QR code. And just a reminder that these slides will be available on our AFT website, which Kara will drop in the, or she might have already dropped in the chat. So you can directly access the slides after the presentation. We will put these up. Uh, we also have our April AFT meeting set for April 8th. And Dr. Dave Buller from Klein Bundel from uh, Golden, Colorado, will be presenting on adaptation of an evidence-based occupational sun safety program for underserved outdoor workers in Southwest Georgia. He has been working in this area for many, many decades, as many of you might know, and we are excited to um, showcase his work. And then uh, 2024, June 5 and 6, the COPRICON, the Colorado Pragmatic Research Conference is happening. This is, uh, I think, the fourth year now for this conference. And um, Kara, perhaps we can find and drop the um, theme of the conference into the chat so um, we can kind of feature that. And Russ is here. So Russ, do you want to say anything about Copricon this year? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Other than we hope we can uh, see many of you. It is all virtual, I guess, if it doesn't say that uh this year we've experimented with different uh forms but uh, i think there's all the info people would want to know online including the agenda the different speakers and the different uh sessions if people want to or it's important to submit a uh abstract or you want to do a poster a virtual poster there's info there too that has to be uh in very soon for the poster and you see the early bird registration there but uh that's that's all I got. Thank you, Borsica, and welcome everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Kira. Um, okay, we are ready. So I mentioned to our presenters that I cut their amazing accolades very short because there are three of them and we would like to maximize their time with you. So I'm just going to highlight uh, their main affiliation and encourage them that they share anything that is very relevant to today's talk about their expertise and experience. I will say that I am expecting that most of you are very familiar with all three of them. They are leaders in the field of implementation science. They have been contributing to both uh, topically advancing different uh, topical fields very broadly and then also methods. And that is the reason why we invited them today to talk about how they are thinking about frame in the context of health equity, but they have been collaborating and working together for many, many years. So we are very lucky to have them. Um, I'm going to um, start in the order that they are pre uh, presented on the slide, but I know that um, Dr. Wiltsy Sturman will be the first presenter, but Dr. Anna Bauman is with us from the Brown School uh, in Washington University in St. Louis. She's a research assistant professor there. 
And again, many of you are very familiar with her work, work in health equity and adaptations and many other things. Um, Dr. J.D. Smith is an associate professor in the University of Utah, and uh, he has a number of other key leading roles at uh, the University of Utah and elsewhere. And again, his work in with the list has been the most recently um, highlighted by our group in terms of importance, but he has contributed to many other methodological improvements in the field. And then Dr. Shannon Wiltsy Sturman, an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And um, uh, Shannon has also uh, contributed tremendously to the field in terms of the development of the original frame and then the further uh, variations of it and also to the field of mental health broadly, uh, a lot of different new innovations. So we are super lucky to have all three of them together in a talk. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to them. I know that Shannon, you will start with the sharing, I think, and then you will guide this through. I would like to encourage everyone to use the chat, as Russ mentioned it there, to uh, put in your questions as we go. Don't wait until the end. Um, I didn't check with our speakers how they would like to go about questions. If we see something immediately relevant, should we hold it? Or would you like us to indicate it in some ways and would like to stop to answer? What would be easier? Um, maybe anything clarifying we could answer in the moment and then um, save the other questions for the end. Perfect. Thank you so much for the guidance. And uh, Shannon, I will hand this over to you now. Thank you for being here. Okay. All right. Let's see if everybody can see that. All right. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today. This is um, derived from some work that we presented at the DNI conference in a pre-conference workshop. And um, it's something of a work in progress. We're, we're, um, we're making progress and we're actually gonna ask you all for some input today as well. But today we'll be talking about how um, we use the frame to code and think about equity oriented adaptations. And um, if I can advance my slides, it always does this funny thing when I share the presentation, there we go. Um, so first of all, we're going to talk about and um, distinguish adaptations made to promote health equity and to address culture and the needs of historically marginalized populations. We'll talk about how we apply the frame to capture equity-centered adaptations. And then we'll talk about methodological considerations for evaluating the impact, um, because that's one of the, the big goals of de developing the frame. So we have kind of a shared language and we can start working towards understanding whether and how adaptations and modifications um, impact the outcomes that we really care about. Um, and as we do this, um, we want to mention that over time, as we've uh, developed the frame and then kind of iterated on the code book, um, we've tried to make some implicit assumptions and some implicit things more explicit in the frame, especially around um, how we think about adaptations to promote equity. And we'd love your input, either on how you're using the frame or how you think, you know, things we, you think we need to consider um, to make the frame more um, amenable to um, equity centered adaptation. So if you go, I think we're gonna pop that in the chat as well, that link, but feel free to put your ideas and thoughts and feedback in the chat as well on how the frame can be used um, to center equity. So we're gonna uh, start today with a few assumptions and a few assumptions that we use as we're um, thinking about using the frame to characterize adaptations and modifications um, that we've established at least in theory, if not empirically, which components of your intervention um, are important and most, uh, most related to outcomes. So what your core components or core functions are. Um, and that you have a, a, a way of tracking fidelity. So basically you know what fidelity is and you know what's an adaptation versus what's fidelity. Um, so you have a fairly well-characterized intervention. Our second assumption is that attending to adaptation and modifications that happen um, more, uh, more ad hoc um, is important as a complement to assessing fidelity and that it's not in conflict with fidelity. And at this point, I don't think this is controversial that adaptation and modifications happen. Um, 
But what we're still learning and what we're still trying to figure out is what the impact of those adaptations are and if they're having the impact that we would, uh, we'd like to see. Um, additionally, that if the goal is, if we need to make an adaptation to promote equity, we should, we should make it happen and we need to make sure it's working. So we wanna talk about that today. Um, and then we're going to go over some definitions of health equity, but we're gonna start with an assumption that if you're here, you're recognizing the importance of and the need for adapting interventions to promote health equity. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time trying to convince you of that. Um, and as always, and part of why we're inviting your feedback is that this is a field that's in progress. We're all still learning. Um, and that you know the, the frameworks and things that we talk about need to evolve as we learn more and as we get more data and information. So today we're not gonna be focusing on how to adapt. Uh, we're not gonna be focusing a lot on measurement issues, psychometrics, those types of, of things. And we're not gonna talk a lot about fidelity um, and thinking about fidelity versus adaptation when you're still developing your intervention um, or about fidelity to the adaptation or implementation process. So we're really talking about fidelity and adaptation to interventions. Um, but there are, um, as, as many, if not all of you know, there are some adaptation frameworks that specify a process um, and that the frame IS um, covers adaptations to the implementation process as opposed to the intervention. So with that, I'm just gonna go through a couple of definitions and distinctions. Um, just so we're on the same page here, fidelity is the delivery of the core components or the core functions of an intervention, the adherence with the appropriate level of skill or competent, competence. Modifications is sort of a blanket term. Um, any changes that are made to the intervention or program, whether proactively before you start or over the process of your, um, your efforts to use the intervention. And then adaptation is um, a more proactive and planned set of modifications. Um, it's a strategy that addresses the interplay between the fit of the intervention, the process of the implement of implementation and the context. And just to, as a graphic, just to sort of show you modifications is the blanket term. Some of those, the ones that are planned and ideally driven by some sort of data or information about what we need and whether it's working ultimately. Um, adaptation is a subset of modifications. And then those can be um, fidelity consistent or inconsistent. Um, and that can be a, a useful distinction, especially when we're trying to understand whether these adaptations or modifications have the impact that we would like to see. So briefly, when we talk about health equity, um, it's a process that requires continuous action to address historical and contemporary injustices and to allocate resources according to need. Um, that's a definition by Jones and colleagues. Um, that context is defined by all the different levels that we think about the social, organizational, political, and external factors that influence the successful delivery of evidence-based interventions. And so really when we're selecting or using an intervention, we need to think about the context where it was shown to work and how the system or intervention needs to be adapted to make sure that it fits and works as well as possible in different contexts. So I'm gonna give a, I'm gonna start a quick overview of the frame and then I'm gonna hand it off to Anna to, um, to finish that up before we hand it over to JD to talk about methodological considerations. So the frame was actually an expansion of a 2013 framework that we developed um, that came out in 2019. And in it, we had some, we had reasons for, um, for adapting. We had, we had things like, um, our decision at the time is that adaptations and modifications can be made um, for many reasons and that different types of adaptations, especially when we get to the content level, um, can happen for different reasons. Some might be cultural, some might be to promote equity, to improve fit, but not all. So you can have an adaptation that adds something, you can have a, a, an adaptation that tailors, you can have, a, have an adaptation that integrates other interventions. And those all might be in the service of something like um, adapting to work in a particular context or fit with um, a particular population's needs and shared understandings and culture. Um, so we had a specifier for cultural adaptation, but we didn't call it out as specifically. 
Um, and over time, we've gotten a little bit more intentional and a little bit more specific. Um, so we've added more reasons. What's highlighted here are just a couple of things that are, are new in that we haven't really presented until last December. Um, although they, they were showing up in the code book, which is on a website that I can put in the chat and give you at the end of the, um, of the talk. But we had added reasons and the reasons, um, as we talk about a little bit later, um, really were drawn from implementation determinants and social determinants of health. Um, we did have some goals um, where we had improved fit and also to address culture, we'd sort of um, put as a, a specifier for that. But um, we have added um, a few other things just to make sure that we're, we're really capturing some of the different ways and reasons that um, adaptations are made, particularly to promote equity. So up in this, I'm not gonna walk through this whole framework now because we're gonna talk about some of the little different pieces, but the way it's laid out, we, we start with sort of the when, the who, the how, the whys, um, you know, and the, the framework is intended to document all of these things. When we're doing analyses or when we're trying to be more pragmatic, we might really just focus on a subset, like the nature, the reasons, um, the goals, et cetera. But the, um, but we sort of thought of it as, you know, the who, what, why, et cetera, the where. So starting with how, um, one of the things that I want to call out is that we have fidelity consistent and inconsistent adaptations mentioned. And to use these, as I mentioned, we assume that you have something that's been tested or that you know what fidelity is. So you know which components or functions are clearly specified that you've got a measure of fidelity and that you've figured out what you think is most um, essential to get the outcomes you're hoping for. Um, if you're using the fidelity consistent or inconsistent code on the frame, um, which is down here, um, the relationship to fidelity down here on the right in the middle, um, that we do have an unknown because um, there are things that, that we're not we're not sure if it's um, a core piece or if it's really something that you can kind of take or leave or make big changes to. And because that that does come up, we have an unknown. Um, but we do encourage people to use either the theory or evidence they have to identify a fidelity consistent and inconsistent. Um, and I think th at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Anna. But one other just quick thing I want to say is that um, one of the, you know, one of the things that we think about a lot with this is that, you know, we might learn through this process that things that we thought were fidelity consistent actually are not, at least in certain contexts. So um, part of why we want to encourage people to document what they're doing and try to link it to some sort of outcome data is so that we can learn whether, at least in certain contexts, um, certain things, you know, are actually not fidelity consistent or, you know, the, the level and the, the types of changes that you can make in these different contexts. So I am going to turn it over to Anna here to take us through some of these next components of the frame. Thank you, Shannon. There is like a whole conversation happening in the chat. And so before I start with the slides, I just want to ask you, it's a very clear question. Can plant adaptations happen during an implementation trial or do they need to be prior to an implementation? Yes, and that is a great question. And um, it, it comes up a lot because, and one example that it is kind of still salient for a lot of people is COVID. So during COVID, we had to make a bunch of un unplanned adaptations very quickly, you know, where all of a sudden, you know, you were seeing people over FaceTime or you were, you know, suddenly doing home visits or telephone visits or things like that. And initially that was all reactive and unplanned. But as you're learning over the course of your implementation project, you might recognize that there is a need to make a change. And then you might kind of enter into a, a process that's more planful. We saw this as systems started to adopt telehealth systems and find ways to, to do things remotely. Then it became a little bit less of a quick reactive, whatever works in the situation, improvisation. And it became more planful, more proactive, either on the part of the systems or the providers. So I do think that, you know, if you're learning during your implementation about an adaptation that needs to make, be made, and it's not something where everybody's sort of improvising and just doing whatever they think they need to do in the moment, you can count it as planned. 
I think that a really good example is using something like that dynamic adaptation process or something that you're prospectively saying, I'm going to apply this framework. We're going to re-examine whether adaptation is needed based on data that's gathered. And so you're you're very much saying we're 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 intending to if there's uh, indication. The one thing that's kind of tricky about that is you don't know exactly what the adaptation is going to be because it's going to be driven by data. You're just specifying up front. We are going to have a process in place to to make these decisions and decide how and and, and what to modify if it's necessary. What a perfect segue for the who decides and who participates in the modification, right? Um, and so I put the the link again. We are we are really struggling. I am struggling. Shannon and, and JD might not be struggling on how to conceptualize equity as we capture how to use equity lens when we think about frame, right? So we had, as Shannon mentioned, we had ideas, but now we're making it explicit. And when you think about equity as a process, one of the things, for example, in the who participates in the decision to modify is a really important bucket to think about, right? So Shannon gave an example, JD gave an example. I'm gonna give you another example of a trial where we adapted an intervention, a behavior motivation intervention for elder patients in the context of pre-surgery. So we adapted the, it's in context of mental health, we adapted the setting and we adapted the for the patients. And once the trial started running, we saw that there were not diverse participants in our trial. So now we're adapting it even more to incorporate other voices and other people in those trials, right? So Russ, to your point, in the process of implementation, as we were looking for um, the trial within an, with an equity lens, we are further adapting things. So there is the who in our frame. Um, and when we think about equity, it's really thinking about who makes a decision and why. And most importantly, perhaps in a lot of our studies, who is missing and why, right? Next, Shannon. Yep, yeah, let's see, here we go. So the why. <laughs> um, so we had the why at the bottom and now as Shannon has mentioned, we are trying to make it more explicit, which I think frame tells a story about the field of implementation sciences, right? It's like we had a framework, we adapted, we added reasons, and now we are trying to make things more explicit and more intention about the equity space. So. Um, when we think about reach or engagement, reach is not just participants, but also reach in terms of settings, right? To make, make the intervention more appealing or accessible to a specific group. Are you thinking about retention? What does that mean? Uh, improving feasibility, especially when we think about low resource settings, the fit with the recipients, the fit of the context, the fit of the recipients, the fit of the intervention, it's an interplay, a 3D, 4D dimension here, right? Uh, we're going to talk about cultural aspects. And this is something that we've also had conversation about what is adapting period, what is adapting for culture, what is adapting for other components. And we're going to have some slides for that. Whether you're adapting to improve effectiveness or you know outcomes to reduce or promote equity, reduce disparities or promote equity. And sometimes those things are not the same. So it's important for you to sit down and think about what is the real goal. Think about cost. And one of the things that we've had a lot of conversations as you think about equity and those pieces here is that part of the conversation might be a short outcome, a medium outcome and a long-term outcome, right? And so part of what we are trying to embrace and, and help us think about is how can you capture those pieces as you adapt your intervention in this case uh, for long, short, medium, and long-term outcome. Next. So this is where I, I'm also learning uh, because it's not straightforward like life is not straightforward, um, that not all adaptations are necessarily cultural adaptations. So we we put here two examples and we would love your feedback as well, because this is if there's a group to give feedback on this, this is you, right? So think about, for example, tailoring stories that illustrate concepts, say in a content, you're, you're changing the content, content of, an, of an intervention. 
You might adapt it for culture, right? You're adding components, storytelling. You might think about infographics. You might think about the metaphors that you're using. That's a cultural adaptation. You might not necessarily do that in terms of culture, but it might be because you're adapting a manual for younger adults, for older adults, for adults only, right? And that might be a developmental adaptation instead of a cultural adaptation. So what we're doing here, we're really trying to think about how can we carefully conceptualize what it is that we're doing so we're not putting everything under one single umbrella, right? Because if you cannot identify the object of study, you cannot foster the methodology of that study and, and foster the field. Same here uh, in terms of religious and cultural uh, reason, you might be adapting things because you want to get closer to, to the community. It might be just because of geographic distance, or you might actually be adapting an intervention, moving intervention from one setting to another because of cultural reasons. So it's just really when we capture the reasons for adapting is really being thoughtful about that. Um, and here's another example in terms of changing the reading level. You might be changing the reading level because of norms or because learning differences, disability. So not necessarily culture. And it might depend, right? It might be both. And so it's just really thinking about what is the goal of your adapting process. What is the adaptation that you're doing? I love the pictures. Uh, so you might adapt content. You might adapt context. Shannon mentioned the relationship with fidelity, fidelity consistent, fidelity inconsistent. You might not know, and that's okay. Uh, we're in, in several projects where there is the, the fidelity or the core component is not well defined. And part of what we're doing here then in frame is really tracking so we can develop the core component of that intervention. The context might be adapted in terms of format, setting, personnel, population, and then the nature. And it, there is a brainstorm process here in terms of what it is that you can adapt. And I uh, will ask Shannon to you know, allow all of us, if you have yet another set of nature modification, let us know. So you may strengthen uh, substitute information, you may add elements, you may remove elements, you may reorder elements. So it's really tracking what it is that you're doing uh, in the process. And Anna, it looks like um, we have a question that it's probably um, worth just addressing uh, briefly now. Why yeah. is it important to add, uh, to distinguish cultural adaptations from non-cultural adaptations? So I will give you my my answer first again, and then I would love to hear Shannon because this is the conversation that she had <laughs> multiple places. So I've been in places where people tend to bundle everything in culture adaptation, right? And so there is a catch 22 when you do that because then everything is culture, which you can argue that everything is culture. But when I think about, I, I really like the example that Shannon gave in terms of the development piece or disability piece, because the literature that makes me read is a different literature than cultural adaptation. So if I'm adapting infographics for people with disabilities, I'm reading people with disabilities infographics literature and how to think about that. If I am adapting for religion culture, I'm gonna read that literature and think about that. And so it's really thinking about, if you think about the goals, right? It's really disentangling and not bundle everything in the same bucket because the literature, the, the methods might be different for what you're doing. Shannon, I would love your, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the reasons it became um, important to me is, you know, because sometimes I would see things like adapting for literacy um, would be just automatically kind of thought of as a cultural adaptation if it was working with people who were from a non, you know, sort of a non-dominant culture in a particular country because people, you know, who are historically marginalized, disadvantaged, maybe had fewer educational options, um, maybe often had lower reading levels, right? That's, I mean, again, you could argue in a way that that's culture, but in a way that's sort of, um, 
I think it was too broad of a brush. It's not, that's not necessarily culture. That's, that's a, you know, that might be because of a marginalization access to resources and not necessarily something about the culture. And so I think it's, it's really trying to make sure that we're being as, um, you know, as, as accurate as we can and, and as um, respectful as we can about the different reasons that we need to, to make these modifications. And now we're going to talk about reasons. <laughs> it brings us to reasons. <laughs> uh, so this is this this is to me one of the things. It's it's the is a challenge in some space, and 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 uh, especially when we think about equity, right? So, as Shannon mentioned, uh, there is a lot more than just literacy and adapting for literacy. And so when we bring in the lenses of social determinants of health, it helps us think about what are, again, the short term, long, medium term, long term, and what are really the forces driving whatever it is that's happening in our studies. Um, so she, she put the example of, you know, say, if you're, if you're adapting something, you might adapt a distribution of, you know, because it's low resource settings, but it's also thinking about the why that is low resource settings. What are the payment, the allocation, the policies that are affecting all of the things, right? Implementations, political and economic. And so when we think, when we add the layers of equity and social determinants of health, it's helping us think about those pieces. Um, one thing that we debated a lot was there are a lot of health equity frameworks and so we didn't want to, right? Frame is already complex as it is. And so the goal here is not to, to make it even more complex. The goal here is really to help us think about what it is that we're adapting, why, and the reasons here, right? The what for. So if there are other frameworks out there that speak better, especially for adapting for equity lens, um, use them. So, Next, Shannon, I think next is their framework, right? Ah, as I said. So for example, one of the frameworks is, if you go to the next, <laughs> the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, right? Not all framework, frameworks are frameworks. And so they're all gonna have fantastic things and they're all gonna have drawbacks, right? And so if you want to use another framework to justify the reasons for adaptation, do so. What we are asking you is when you do that, to be really thoughtful about the why you're doing that, right? Because we have already a lot of reasons. And so maybe when some of those reasons are not there and you can bring from other places, it's just being, again, thoughtful and, and embracing all the pieces. Right. And I would say, you know, we want to... Uh you know, there's a risk to having a frame for this and a frame for that and a frame for this. And um, and so sometimes maybe just pulling in reasons and, and talking about where you've drawn them from or referencing other frameworks might be a bit more of an efficient way rather than having eight different versions, adaptations of the frame ad nauseum. <laughs> right. How many versions of frame can you have? And we've already already adapted. So if, you know, the new version of frame is, is on the website and I will put the, again, the, the link again. Um, so, so here's really, again, a list of many things and we've adapted in December. <laughs> Cause that's the beautiful piece about collaborating with people. Right. But it's, it's really thinking about the reasons for it and how can you capture if it's appropriate, the short, medium, long term. Husa has a really important comment. Um, cultural adaptations, if not made, can affect the fidelity, uh, patient engagement, and responsiveness. Therefore, it will be important to classify the types of adaptations, whether cultural or not, to understand their impact on the outcome or fidelity. Right. So who's exactly that's exactly what we're advocating, right? So um, if if we take a look at the at the literature and cultural adaptation, because there's a huge literature in systematic reviews, right? There's data over data showing that yes, if we are to recruit, retain, and improve outcomes of historically marginalized populations, we should adapt. The piece then is to your point, 
for us to track what it is that we're adapting, how, when, and why, so we can identify the relationship between all of those pieces of the puzzles that are moving, right, with the effectiveness aspect. Reasons. So here, uh, there's a lot of words here. So, <laughs> Shannon, I think what we, we talked about in terms of individual level is there are many reasons, right? So you can think about race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, uh, religion, disability, et cetera, et cetera. And here again is to think about some of those aspects you can code at the provider, at the recipient levels. And it's really thinking about uh, what it is that you're adapting and why, right? So if training a therapist need to include translation of concepts, then you might need to, uh, the code would be to adapt at the individual level language, right? If you're adapting the language because you want to address trust and mistrust, then the code is a different level, right? It might be at the provider, it might be at the recipient, it might be at the organizational level. So it's, again, really thinking about what it is that you're adapting, what is the goal for adaptation that you're doing. JD, all yours. Great, <laughs> thanks. So I get to talk a little bit about some methodological considerations in the context of adaptations that occur and one helpful way of thinking about this, which is borrowing terms that you've already heard in our talk today, is thinking about this like a three-dimensional cube. So you can see at the top, you have sort of uh, your conceptualization of the relation of the adaptation to fidelity, whether it's been a, whether it's a fidelity consistent adaptation, or potentially it was a you know likely unplanned uh, fidelity inconsistent adaptation that occurs during uh, a, a trial itself during the implementation. Uh, on another plane, you have the when. So whether this was a planned, unplanned, and I think this is sort of a, a more of a fully prospective versus a somewhat um, data-driven on the fly, uh, because that certainly does affect your uh, the ability for you to actually test the impact of some of these unplanned strategies, or sorry, unplanned adaptations. So let me we'll talk about that in a second. And then the last piece is really the, the the where question, right? The the who does it apply to? Does it apply to all participants and all sites? Does it apply to the majority, uh, or is it only applied to a subgroup? So a, a good example being some cultural adaptations may only occur for a particular subsample of of the overall uh, population that's included in the trial, and that is a very different way uh, of being analyzed than if you applied it to everyone uh, who was uh, participating. So we'll kind of think about uh, the adaptations using this three-dimensional cube. Sorry, go ahead. So when you have planned ad adaptations um, that occur during a trial, um, typically planned adaptation where we are, you know, very prospective and thinking about these uh, from a fidelity consistent adaptation, they, they tend to be that. They tend to, to, to follow uh, fidelity to the intervention um, and it's applied typically to all study participants. Uh, but not always. Um, in this example, uh, that, that's where we're starting from. So the why question here, uh, why you would actually want to test this, um, you may want to compare the effectiveness of the unadapted evidence-based intervention versus the, ED, uh, the EBI that's been adapted uh, during the project, right? So at this point, you have a very clear delineation of, hey, it was unadapted until a certain point. It was adapted. We want to see if that adaptation was actually successful. Uh, in, in improving some process or outcome metric. Um, so in this type of a scenario, if you are doing this to actually formally test this unadapted versus adapted version of the EBI, you may want to use an actual adaptive study design um, that has a predetermined point where you can test the before and after and you're powered uh, to actually do so. And hopefully you've actually uh, also aligned the outcome metric or the process metric that you're interested in with the type of adaptation that is going to happen. So again, this has to be a little bit more planful. You kind of know what adaptation is going to happen. Um, you can also use an interrupted time series design, again, depending on uh, the, the, the other considerations about what type of design you have. Um, you could apply the dynamic adaptation process or a similar data-driven model. 
uh, where you are learning what adaptation needs to be made during the unadapted portion of this study design, and then the adaptation itself occurs, and you can test uh, that. Uh, it's probably better to simply do a parallel two or three arm trial uh, than to do a sequential interrupted time series, in part because if you know what adaptation you're going to make, it's a much more efficient uh, study design to just say, hey, we're going to have the unadapted version happening simultaneously to an adapted version and compare those across study samples rather than a within study design, just because of the time frame and the number of subjects you might need. Okay, so next slide, um, we're gonna talk about the uh, more common situation that people uh, often come to us with, or at least to me, is okay, we had an unplanned adaptation or something that occurred during the trial. We did not necessarily have a design or, or the study itself uh, had planned for this to happen, but we still need to analyze whether or not the adaptation that occurred had a positive or negative effect uh, on our outcomes. Okay, so how do you, how do, you do this? So let's think about our cube again. So we have an unplanned yet fidelity consistent adaptation that applies to all study participants. Okay, so a very clear delineation typically here. Uh, at a certain time point, we made a change. It's supposed to be fidelity consistent. It applies to everyone. In situations where this would be considered a minor adaptation, um, which everyone's definition of minor versus moderate versus major is probably going to differ. Um, but very minor adaptations that are fidelity consistent, you might not need to do anything from a study design perspective or from an analysis perspective, other than applying frame to characterize or describe the adaptation that happened, uh, and then you know carry out your trial typically as, uh, as it was uh, planned prior to that. If this fidelity consistent adaptation happens to be more major, uh, or I guess major in this, in this case is determined by whether you think it actually is going to have a significant effect on a particular outcome, you may want to apply a within-group uh, pre-post adaptation analysis. So it's slightly different than what we talked about previously, because previously we had certain time points uh, where we could actually test this and have a study design that incorporated this research question. Here, we weren't necessarily planning to make an adaptation but we did, it was fidelity consistent. We wanna test whether it had an impact. So depending on the analytic approach that you're using, um, this time point difference or the pre-post comparison could be treated as a fixed effect or potentially as a moderating variable, again, really depending on the analytic approach. So a question that you might ask is, does the treatment effect vary as a function of receiving the adapted versus unadapted version of the EBI? And in that case, you could just simply treat this as a, as a fixed effect for people who are exposed to the unadapted versus people who are exposed to the adapted, sort of in the study time frame. Uh, next example. So here again, we have a, an unplanned fidelity consistent adaptation, but in this scenario, we're only going to apply it to a subgroup of study participants. So uh, let's just say we have a sample that's uh, about half uh, a Latino Hispanic and half non-Hispanic white. And we realize at some point that we need to make an adaptation that's only going to apply to the materials presented to the Latino Hispanic population in our study. And so we want to see whether or not those adaptations actually had an impact really on that study group because they're the ones who are going to be exposed to it, not the non-Hispanic white uh, who are also in the study. So um, in this example, uh, you know, so I'm gonna, I'll give an example too here of an obesity prevention program where you have family, some families that are experiencing food insecurity, some that are not. So you could do a subgroup analysis essentially of the food insecure versus food secure families and see whether or not the adaptation for food insecure uh, was able to have an impact. So in this case, you do a post hoc within group comparison, simply comparing the, the uh, food insecurity pre-adaptation versus food insecurity post-adaptation to see if those adaptations for this subgroup actually uh, had an impact. Uh, in certain modeling, uh, you could also treat this as a two-way interaction effect, uh, again, just depending on what analytic model you're using. Uh, next example. So here we have uh, a, a situation where uh, an unplanned adaptation occurred. It was determined to be fidelity inconsistent uh, using the you know, kind of baseline fidelity uh, conceptualization for the EBI. And it was done by sites or implementers within sites. So again, this is sort of a, a you know something that was out of the control of the research team. So let's say this actually occurred at the beginning of the study. So some sites or implementers simply made an adaptation before they even started or right from the outset. 
if that's a major uh, uh, modification and it's fidelity and consistent, in very strict RCT rules, you may actually need to throw out this data. Uh, in most of our pragmatic designs that we that are more common in implementation research, you would not want to throw data away. Um, this is more of the kind of explanatory efficacy trial approach. Uh, so there, we'll talk about how to deal with that. Um, if it's considered a minor uh, adaptation, even though it's fidelity and consistent, you may actually be able to get away with doing what would be considered like a sensitivity analysis where you include the data and don't include the data in your primary analysis to see what type of an effect it may have had. And, this, and then it, that, that analysis would dictate whether the data is kept uh, for the final analysis or not. Um, let's actually say though that it did not occur at the beginning of the study, but it occurred during the implementation where there's a very clear point of departure from the protocol at some point. So in this case, if it's major, again, if you're following strict RCT rules, you may have to throw data out after the deviation or violation that occurred uh, because the intervention is no longer being delivered with fidelity. That's really the kind of underlying assumption there. Uh, in, a, in a situation where this uh, fidelity inconsistent adaptation is relatively minor, again, we could conduct sensitivity analyses to determine whether or not our primary analysis should be uh, should include the data that occurred after the fidelity inconsistent minor adaptation, uh, or we need to actually get rid of that data because it had a, a, a significant negative impact uh, on a primary outcome. So again, this is kind of blending pragmatic explanatory uh, study design thinking um, and not really testing adaptation as a primary research question, but kind of a, a whoopsie, uh, what do we do with this now that this happened? Uh, next example. So there's a couple special considerations for rollout designs where timing is much more uh, critical than in a parallel cluster uh, randomized design or, or otherwise a parallel group randomized design. Uh, so obviously in stepped wedges, you have a series of rollouts uh, or a series of, of crossovers where uh, sites or implementers are rolled out uh, over a predetermined sequence. And you can see the top and bottom are just two different versions of rollout designs, the top being a, a formal stepped wedge, uh, the lower being an incomplete or modified stepped wedge or simply a rollout design. So the next slide has a lot of information on it. I'm going to walk through it very, very uh, uh, slowly. Uh, if you look at the stepped wedge uh, figure at the top and look at number one, so what that vertical line there means is that there was a, uh, an adaptation that occurred at the end of quarter two of year two. And you can see by that delineation there, that vertical line, that this adaptation happened essentially at the beginning of cluster three, okay? So in this situation, you have enough control data and enough intervention data prior to and after the adaptation that you could do a test of pre and post. Right, and the determination of the of the unplanned versus planned at this point uh, just goes into your interpretation and the importance of this type of an analysis. But essentially, at that time point in a rollout, you'd have sufficient data to do a pre-post, kind of as you might in other situations. If you look down below at a similar situation within an incomplete stepped wedge, you have vertical line number two on the bottom figure, um, where uh, it is done so that data might be thrown out. Uh, depending on the nature of the adaptation. The reason that for this is that implementation has ended in cluster one, and it has not yet started in clusters four and five. So you don't actually have a lot of pre-post data, and it's inconsistent across each cluster uh, in the rollout sequence. So this presents additional problems um, that sort of cluster one uh, has a very different intervention now potentially than the clusters that follow uh, because of this adaptation. So if it's a major adaptation, uh, that's that's slightly different than a, a minor adaptation. Uh, if you are, and it's not a major adaptation, you could do the before and after test. But again, you might be limited to clusters two and three for this evaluation uh, because cluster one is not affected uh, by this adaptation. If you look at cluster, uh, sorry, uh, number three, sorry, Shannon, uh, back up to the top stepped wedge. If you had a later adaptation, um, you don't have enough control data to do the comparison except for in cluster five, which is very limiting. So you can do a pre-post evaluation in cluster five only, uh, but cluster four, three, two, and one, uh, there wouldn't be sufficient uh, uh, data uh, to actually do a within cluster comparison. So this, it's just the timing within these rollouts presents major challenges uh, for analyzing the effect of adaptations. Um, looking at number four, this is a horizontal line, meaning that essentially clusters three, four, and five 
uh, had an adaptation that maybe we made based on data because we weren't able to engage certain participants or something you know really needed to happen. And so in this case, we actually can compare clusters one and two to clusters three and four on our implementation data or the pre and post adaptation uh, that uh, you know can really look at the before and after adaptation effects. So this would probably be a situation where this was planned. We specifically made this change when we actually rolled out from clusters two to cluster three, and we can look at that. Uh, in example number five, uh, which really is a box that is highlighting that the adaptation only occurred within cluster four and did not occur you know, across time or across uh, different clusters there, you might have to toss the data from the cluster or conduct sensitivity analysis, again, depending on whether this is sort of a minor uh, adaptation that's fidelity consistent or uh, whether or not you actually have uh, a major adaptation where this, this may need to actually just be thrown out because it's so different from the other uh, implementations that have been done. So again, this is a, a lot of information and, and not a lot of detail on the analytic approach because you can use different analytic methods, but just thinking about the impact of adaptations at different time points in a rollout, you can see how complicated this can get and how challenging it can be to interpret um, adaptations that occur when they're not planned or built into your study design. And JD, we had a question in the chat. When you say sure. toss the data, do you mean like toss it, toss it, never look at it, it's gone, it's, it's, it's like it didn't happen? Or do you mean your kind of treat to protocol analysis would not consider the data, but that you'd keep it and look at it for other yeah, reasons? Yeah, so if you're, if you're doing an, an ITT analysis, you would keep it and have to have to do some comparisons to see how different this data was. Uh, in a per protocol analysis, uh, this would be a toss the data situation. Um, you could still potentially make use of the data, but if you're, again, following very strict RCT per protocol analysis, the interpretation would be that this intervention is, is, is not the same, that this is not actually the intervention. This is a fidelity, inconsistent, unplanned adaptation. And so we really can't treat this, this group of patients or participants that got the adapted version as being the same as those that, that got, the, got the fidelity, high fidelity uh, version of the EBI. So yeah, it, it really depends on, again, is this an explanatory trial, a pragmatic trial, an ITT? Um, but yeah, you'll have to work through that with a statistician and hopefully have some of these uh, decisions and plans specified a priori in your protocol. So the last thing I wanna just bring your attention to is that there is one paper that is called the A-frame, which is an analysis of frame data. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about this. I just want to bring, actually give this as an example. But essentially, this was a mixed methods evaluation that was relying uh, very heavily on qualitative methods to really understand the nature of the adaptations. It was not built into an actual quantitative uh, uh, data analysis model, um, but still a really good example of how to dig deeply into uh, the, qual the qualitative nature of some of the adaptations beyond just the coding of what Frame typically does. So uh, yeah, just a good example of how to get more data. And we'll share the we'll share the slides, but essentially this was what A-frame showed as a three-step analysis plan uh, for a, for a mixed methods analysis of adaptation. Okay, so now we've got a few minutes left, um, and and we really appreciate the questions and comments in the chat. Um, if you have thoughts or ideas for us or feedback you'd like to provide, we'd love to have you. I just put the link for the Padlet in the chat again. Um, and would love to have your, your thoughts and inputs there, but please uh, feel free to ask any questions um, and, uh, you know, comments, ideas. Uh, we're very open, and I'm going to just move it to this last slide where we have um, some information about where you can find the most recent frame codebook, as well as information about the frame IS, et cetera. Um, and um, so that's all available at this website. And then I also know Borsa can put in the chat that you can get to slides, chat, um, et cetera, um, through the links that she provided. So we've got a couple more minutes. Any other thoughts or questions, things we can clarify, ideas? We're open to all of it. This was amazing and so many, um, especially JD, what you talked about, I have to sit down and think more about it because it's it's pretty complex as you suggested and you did a great job of slowing it down for us, but really we'll need to process, um, especially in some of the studies that we are doing. Um, I don't have a question because I wanna make sure that others ask, but I just wanted to come in as well and invite people to unmute at this point if they want to. 
we only have time for perhaps a couple of questions. So please do go ahead and unmute and ask your question. And I did see one question. I'm not sure that we got to um, uh, as much as we might like the uh, question about um, explaining differences between adaptation and tailoring within the context of ERIC implementation strategies. And yeah, this is something we talk about adaptation can be an implementation strategy, it can be an outcome, but it takes lots of different forms. Um, and tailoring is actually, we think of it as a form of adaptation, you know, kind of a minor, um, generally fidelity consistent adaptation. Um, we want to highlight it because, I mean, I think a lot of people would say that it, for many interventions, people are tailoring all the time. You know, they're doing that to sort of, um, you know, meet the person they're working with where they are to make sure that they're kind of, um, you know, using language, terminology, um, you know, that they're presenting concepts in a way that's really going to um, make sense or, or that they're changing, you know, things just slightly to make it fit. And, you know, so where's the line, you know, between when it becomes an adaptation versus where it's just competent delivery, I think is a, a good and fair question. We like to highlight tailoring and, and name it as an adaptation to acknowledge that it does happen. And um, because if we are tracking it, you know, then we can learn over time um, how much it matters and what context it matters once it, when it's especially important. So I would say there's not as much of a difference um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I wanted to make sure we got to that one. Any other questions or thoughts or things that we might've missed in the chat? I think we have gotten through those. Some very good activity there. Thank you to everyone for putting in answers. So. Well, I would say that we are at the top of the hour, basically, so I would just slowly um, um, close down this uh, wonderful presentation and thank uh, all three presenters for being here together and sharing with us these really innovative and novel thinking around these issues. We will continue grappling with this, I'm sure many of us, uh, as we move forward with our own work. Um, thank you for being here and uh, looking at lots of thank yous in the chat as well. And we will be posting the recording and the slides on our website. Perhaps, Kara, you can drop it in one more time where people can find these. And I hope that you all will gather around these topics in future months, including next month when we will be meeting with Dr. Dave Buller. So thanks again and have a good week. <laughs>